I bet if I were to ask you, give me three words or phrases to describe democracy, you probably wouldn't pick centralized, autocratic, and surveillance-based. Whether it's your biological DNA or your information online, the questions are, who owns the data? Where is it stored? Who gets to use it for what reason? And uh, congratulations on the book. You know, in it, you say the internet is broken. Let's start with that first bit. We had this awesome piece of technology that held so much promise. And uh, about 20 years ago, everything changed. You know, instead of it being a decentralized... I feel at heart, I'm a builder and problem solver. And I see a big problem with the internet today. Our, our rights have been stripped from us, it's insidious. And it's crept up on us in a way that we now see the problems and feel the problems because this technology is not designed to help us reach consensus. It's designed to keep us in an endless loop of disagreement. As a photographer and a creative, I had a very big problem with using Instagram as a necessity to exist, to survive, to find jobs. All of these social media web two platforms from like the design uh, that's made to make people addicted to it, to the actual data scraping, um, just, I couldn't do it anymore. We totally lost control of our identity in the web two world. When you think about what is your digital identity, you probably end up with your Facebook account or your Google account. And uh, controlling the identity of people is uh, the fundamental goal that those companies have. If you look at all the big tech companies, which have the highest market caps in history, you realize it's huge databases behind it, right? Amazon has the world's largest database of consumer reviews of products. That's social data. Uh, Google's massive database, they have, right? These huge databases um, that have been compiled that are actually constructed largely by humanity, this data, I, I feel like, should be a natural resource like water or wind power and you know, can be harnessed by, by all, all of humanity. Nobody actually thought about the problem that there could be data accumulating at certain points. Uh, they, they didn't think of it. Uh, so and when you make new laws and try to regulate them, this is just not going to work. It's like in, in the, my, my bathroom tap drips. And what do I do? I call a lawyer? Probably not. You call a plumber. So you, you need the technologists to solve that. And this is what's happening now. The internet was wrong. And this is why Google and Facebook emerged. And Web3 is more the vision of um, building the missing protocol layers uh, and making them common good. We have to fix the internet. Polkadot is here as a tool of Web3. It's about lowering barriers. It's about ensuring that the resource that Polkadot produces can be used by as many use cases as possible. At this performance level, it will almost certainly be the cheapest, secure, decentralized system in the market. Polkadot is designed for the future more than any other Web3 tech stack that I have ever encountered. You know, if you were to choose to build on Ethereum or Cosmos or Avalanche, um, you're really choosing where to confine yourself to. But for us, what we're building, we are looking to, you know, contribute global protocols to this new iteration of the internet. And by building on Polkadot, it allows us essentially to build everywhere. The tech is best in class. So if you look just the broader blockchain ecosystem, a lot of projects are trying to copy what Polkadot's already built. Polkadot is an open technology. And broadly speaking, uh, we have found that regulators have shared our appraisal uh, that Polkadot is indeed a utility um, and that it's a decentralized system. Uh, something that I would say an awful lot of blockchains actually uh, failed to, to achieve. 
We do this through decentralization, not merely at the protocol level, but also at the governance level. Polkadot is the world's biggest DAO. The economy that it governs is the, the biggest DAO-governed economy. It's a fundamentally new concept in society. So like today, if there's a business or an organization that you are a member of, that you contribute to, that you, you, know, you put your time and your energy into, it doesn't matter, it could be you and every one of your peers. And I mean, you all hate the way things are going. You all know that it's going a bad way. But today's world sucks to be you, you know? But with Web3, when you have voting power as an actual primitive, something you can track on chain, you are given a voice. You have the power to share governance, to share control, to share profits as well. You know, we can give power back to the people over these systems. And when they vote, you don't need to trust someone else to carry it out. When there's a majority, when there's consensus, it carries out. It's still in alpha, but like, please try it out. Uh, send dot and KSM. The community in Polkadot is probably the most empowered community out of any web free ecosystem by by a massive massive factor i would say every single decision is made by everybody and anybody can propose any decision and everybody votes on it you have a good idea or something that you have identified as a need do make a proposal and the proposal is discussed initially in some forums and you have to wait for about 28 days so the community votes yay or nay and during that time it's like political elections like okay you need to go and, and, and explain the people what you are, want to build and answer to sometimes uncomfortable questions you feel more rewarded when you feel that the community has put trust in you and you feel that you need to deliver that for them. I think this creates a better environment, more open to collaborate. I'm developing this open source, I'm developing this, like we could combine them to offer something better. The world talent is equally distributed. There's talent everywhere, but opportunity is not equally distributed today. But why? We should create a world where opportunity is equally distributed. And I think the treasury really re represents that because it doesn't matter where you are. It matters your quality of your character and your content. So we were given the tools to say, hey, what you do want, what you would like to see, the formation that you would like to see occur. I'm gonna give you the tools and the power to make that happen, but it ultimately it's up to us. And so like, what would I like to see? I'd like to see some structure, you know, some organization, maybe some roles that come with that that are easily defined. But the cool thing is I can make them happen. Participation is the key for any democracy in a way. And uh, I think uh, that there will be many, many requests from outside the blockchain world to actually have automated governance. So I think this is one of the biggest scenarios where blockchain becomes part of our life in the future that we will take governance pieces out of the blockchain and use them for governance of totally different things. This to me kind of also has a bit of that Bitcoin ethos in it where it was like okay we should be able to send money to each other without intermediary and so on. Well in this case we can make any company also transparent. It's not just the banks that were transparent, it's also the companies. So as much as crypto is a financial movement, it's really a political and social movement. What makes Polkadot really interesting is that it is one of the largest forms of this experiment, right? It is this massive network state that allows people from all over the world, wherever you are, um, to actually come together and work on issues that are consequential. Right? And in the short term, it's more about what needs to get done in the network. It's very technically focused. In the long term, it starts to get much more opinionated in that what is the right direction? What do I believe the right direction the network should move in is? Can you build a really good computer right, that works and that cannot be broken and that cannot be censored? There's the world, because actually it's a, it's a global singleton. Life has a habit of taking you around in circles. Indeed, in the Ethereum days, I made a, a sort of analogy to this big computer in the middle of the world that people could take their turn to use. Developing Polkadot and making it work, um, we ended up uh, creating something far more uh, powerful, which was this um, 
uh, system for doing a lot of computation and doing it securely in consensus. The point of having a formal specification is to underline the fact that JAM is a protocol. It's not a piece of software. If you want to see more about the gray paper, go to graypaper.com. This is the uh, gray paper, uh, the JAM gray paper. Um, it's a formal uh, specification in the same rough format as the yellow paper, the thing that I wrote back in 2014. That's the formal specification of, of Ethereum. With JAM, it's really um, a push towards this original concept, this world computer. A computer, as a sort of unified uh, machine that is scalable enough um, to actually compute significant amounts, like global amounts of transactive data. With JAM, we really want to take the time and build... But the sort of performance that we're talking about is upwards of 10,000 times what Ethereum would be able to do. We are conservatively, so at the lower end, estimating around 150 billion uh, gas per second. Basically, most things that we currently can imagine blockchain doing and applications that we currently think are just would be way too either data I.O. intensive or compute intensive, it would all be manageable from within Jam. Regular, normal program code that people just write, like C, C++ programs, just put it on a blockchain. We are in a world where trust is an all-time low, and it's about computation that we can trust. So if you see in the world today, we have huge advances in AI. The future of what's real is going to be threatened. And I think the tech of decentralized computing and what Web3 really stands for is valuable because it's the only solution, the only tech solution for this. It's not a policy, it's not wishful thinking, it's infrastructure to actually get the job done. Actual tech that will solve problems and let us move into a new era of human society that we need not debate about truth. We'll just look at the code and accept that it has been done and we will move forward. We need to, uh, I, I say this quite a lot, be the change you want to see, right? And we collectively, the Polkadot need to be the change that we want to see and usher in this technology to the masses. I feel that we, the people, can build things to really enable us some freedom. I think it's unstoppable at this point. Once we empower people, shift that power dynamic, incentivize people and give them the benefits of the value that's created, I believe most people will care a lot about their data and how it's used because they'll begin to understand that it's not your data, it's who you are in the digital age. It's your personhood. I liked being a citizen in the analog world. I want to be a citizen again in the digital world. I encourage everyone to take a second look at what we're doing. Because this is a paradigm shift in human society. This is not yet another incremental thing. This is in the history books. It still remains, I think, a fundamental technology in the development of societies. In my mind, it goes down with fire, the wheel, language, printing press. Uh, silicon and, uh, uh, and and perhaps you know perhaps even AI. People need to have a simple stuff, and they need to have something uh, from the Web3, some new value. There's a lot of uh, room for other Web3 technologies and, and non-Web3 technologies to essentially support this, this bigger vision of the verifiable internet. If we want to build a new way of organizing humanity with Web3 and blockchain, we need to consider the bigger picture. 
This is a natural evolution of, uh, of the internet because Web3 is ownership.